If you're new to shocks, it can be really helpful to know what each component of these shocks are called. Johnson Valley, California is where silty desert meets harsh rocks. It's an ideal place for testing and learning about shocks. We sat down with Mike Kim, an off-road racer and one of Fox's top race tuners to learn the parts of a shock and a little bit about how they work. Hi, I'm Mike Kim, race tuner for Fox, and today we're taking a look at all the different parts on the shock absorber. Today, Mike will give us insight into all kinds of shocks, not just the ones on a race vehicle. His insight is relevant no matter what you drive. Trucks, Jeeps, UTVs, snowmobiles, motorcycles, or bicycles. Now, the main job of any shock is to give you control over the motion of your vehicle by converting that motion into heat. The shock does this during both compression and rebound. Compression is when the shock compresses to a collapsed state. Rebound is when the shock extends back to full extension. Today, we'll cover two main categories that are relevant no matter what kind of shock you have or vehicle you drive, springs and dampers. Springs are the first piece of the puzzle to give you control over the motion of your vehicle. Springs store and release kinetic energy, motion. They also ensure that you and your vehicle ride at the proper height. Many bicycles and snowmobiles will have air shocks, where air is in the spring instead of a steel coil. Today, we will focus on coil sprung shocks and go over air shocks in a later video. Now, in this particular shock, uh, we call it a coil over, meaning there's coils over the shock. Depending on the application, a coil shock will use one or more springs. Many coil sprung shocks, like the one on this motorcycle, will have a single spring, but other vehicles may use two or more springs on each of their shocks. Now, it's typical to see a dual rate coil over because on a long travel shock like this, you just can't find springs that are long enough to just run a single spring. So we typically stack two springs on top of each other. Another reason to run a dual rate spring setup is to have more comfort at the beginning of the stroke and more support at the end of the stroke. These two springs working together give the shock a light initial spring rate and a supportive ending spring rate. So we have the preload adjuster, or ride height adjuster, and then we have the crossover rings, and we have the spring divider. Now, obviously this shock is all black, so it's kind of hard to see the spring divider, but this is what it looks like off the shock, and then we also have the crossover ring. Moving further down, uh, the very end here is the spring retainer, and inside here is also spring retainer clips, which uh, hold the spring retainer onto the eyelet. When running a dual rate spring setup, both springs compress together until the spring divider hits the crossover rings. Here's what it looks like on a UTV shock. Dampers absorb energy that is stored and released by the spring. They are the final piece of the puzzle in converting motion to heat and in doing so, allow you to control your vehicle. We have our shock body. So now this could be either a coilover, bypass, or smooth body, but it's still referred to as a shock body. Forks, found on bicycles and motorcycles, are another form of shock and work on the same principles. Moving further down, we have the shaft. Um, these come in different lengths, different diameters. The shaft is what enters the shock body as the shock compresses and exits the shock body as the shock rebounds. The very end of the shock here, at the end of the, the shock body, is the body cap. Now, this typically has your, uh, your spherical bearing. With this shock here, we have a, a remote reservoir. So we have our remote reservoir hose, and then we have our reservoir assembly here, which has the reservoir body, and then also the reservoir end caps at the ends. Now, if you have a piggyback shock, but this is what a piggyback or a typical piggyback looks like. So you just have your piggyback bridge and then you have your reservoir body attached to that. Then we have the bottom out bumper. And so these we make different sizes, different materials, things like that as well. And then we also have the, uh, the eyelet. And again, these come in different lengths and sizes as well. So inside the shock body, You'll have it completely full of oil. Uh, you'll have a piston 
with valving shims and, and various other parts. The valving shims and piston make up what is called the piston assembly. As the piston assembly moves through oil and the shock body, the valving shims restrict oil trying to flow through the piston. This slows the movement of the shaft and spring by converting the motion into heat. Now the, the oil will actually travel through this remote reservoir hose or piggyback bridge. Either way, uh, it goes into the reservoir and in this reservoir is another piston called the internal floating piston or IFP. Now typically in, in a reservoir like this you'll have this part of it filled with oil and then the other part of it filled with nitrogen and the IFP will separate the two. It's important to use an IFP to separate the oil from the nitrogen so that the oil does not foam up from the two mixing together. Oil that is foamed can cause you to lose control. So with this being a hydraulic shock absorber, we can make changes to the way the shock feels by changing the way the oil flows through certain components. Now there's multiple ways to adjust your shock. Uh, you could either go inside the shock and adjust the shims on the piston, or if your shock is equipped with a, a DSC adjuster, you can go ahead and adjust the, uh, the compression through the DSC adjuster. Also, some of our shocks are equipped with rebound adjusters, and so you can actually adjust the, the rebound externally as well. Oftentimes, rebound adjusters are found at the bottom of the shaft on the eyelet, but on some shocks, they may be in a different position, like here on this X2. We'll go over the specifics of making compression and rebound adjustments in a later video. But for now, know that there are a variety of ways you can fine tune the ride of your shocks, both internally and externally. So hopefully this overview helps you with a little more knowledge on all the different components of our shocks. As always, we'd love to hear from you. So if you have any questions or comments, leave them below. And if you'd like to see more videos from us, please subscribe. A little more insight, a little more knowledge. Hopefully. <laughs>